Greetings, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program, When History Meets Imagination, a conversation between Russell Shorto and Jennifer Egan. My name is Marsha Eli, and I'm the Director of Programs at the Center for Brooklyn History. Russell and Jenny are poised behind this digital wall. But before I turn it over to them, I want to quickly share a little bit about the Center for Brooklyn History. We are a part of the Brooklyn Public Library and we hold the most extensive collection of Brooklyn related materials in the world. Every week we offer free public programs through the library's programming arm BPL Presents. Next week, for example, we'll be talking about who gets to control our country's historical narrative, the struggle that is always in play between the past portrayed in narratives like the 1619 Project, and then on the other hand, the past portrayed in narratives like patriotic history and the 1776 Commission. Also next week, we have a program about Jewish food. And that pretty much sums up the range of conversations that we stage. BPL Presents also curates concerts, family programs, and much more. So I, I hope you'll visit the Brooklyn Public Library's website, find BPL Presents, and explore what's coming up. Tonight's conversation is inspired by Russell Shorto's new book, Small Time, A Story of My Family and the Mob, which is a wonderful, engrossing, true story, and one that relies to some degree on recollections of people. And so the question becomes, what's reliable? As Shorto writes in the book, memory is hardly an exact record. Egan's novel, Manhattan Beach, traverses similar territory in that it too aims to be doggedly true and historically factual, and yet as a work of fiction, she had license that Russell did not. So that's one springboard and I'm eager to see where it all leads. One final thing before I disappear, let me invite all of you to share your questions tonight. Simply type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And now it is my pleasure to tell you a little bit about Russell and Jenny and turn it over to them. Russell Shorto is the best-selling author of The Island at the Center of the World, Amsterdam, Revolution Song, and now Small Time. He is a contributing writer at the New York Times Magazine and lives in Cumberland, Maryland. Jennifer Egan is the author of several novels, including the New York Times bestseller, Manhattan Beach, and the Pulitzer Prize winning, A Visit from the Goon Squad. She recently completed a term as president of PEN America. I could say so much more about both of these accomplished individuals, but instead I'm going to say thank you. Thank you for being here, both of you, um, and Take it away. Thank you so much, Marcia. It's great to he be with all of you and, um, and to talk about Russell's fantastic book, which basically took over my life this past week. And I thought maybe a good place to start, Russell, is just kind of where you started. It's a dramatic anecdote. And it, in a way, it gets at the, the heart of this book, which is that it's it's a book about many things, um, the, you know, the mob in small town America, America itself in the post-war years, but really also about your particular family and your relationship to it. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about how this project came about? Sure. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Marsha and the Brooklyn Public Library and the Center for Brooklyn History for, for hosting us and thank Marsha in particular for having the idea to bring us together and to say that I'm really honored to be sharing a stage, even if it's a virtual stage with you, Jenny. I have been such a big fan and such an admirer. Um, uh, my my I, I write narrative history and for the most part it has it's uh, it's narrative, so it's storytelling. It's not academic history. On the other hand, it's footnoted. I I I try to pin things down, um, and for the most part, it's been history that's way back there. Um, I always knew that my grandfather was a small town mob boss, but it's one of those things. I think every family has things that nobody talks. Everybody knows and nobody talks about. Um, 
And as a child, I somehow knew that, but also knew that we don't talk about it. And as an adult, I I was such an obedient uh, child that I think I I thought, well, I, I, I did I built a wall. I didn't even wasn't even going to go there. And then what happened was several years ago, my uh, I was home visiting over Christmas, and um, my uh, it's my father's father who was the, is the center of the book. My mother's cousin was back home. Uh, he had moved back home. Uh, he uh, it turned out he'd been a numbers runner and ran a pool hall for my grandfather back in the day. Uh, he was also a jazz musician, and eventually he left town and spent his whole career in Las Vegas. And um, and uh, he retired, came back home, and this was a couple of days after Christmas, and somebody said, oh, Frank's playing at a little club. Let's go see him. So a group of us went down there, and we're all standing around, and the others are mostly kind of older relatives who have always lived in town and therefore always had this, we don't talk about that, that. Um, but Frank, because he had left so long before, um, to him, these were golden memories. So he had, there's a break in the set and he looks across at me and he says, Russell, you're, you're the writer. What are we going to do about the story? And I said, what story? But even, even as I was saying it, I knew what he meant. And he, he kind of erupts. What story? Your grandfather, the mob. And I could feel the other people kind of, you know, doing that because we don't go there. So he's the one that kind of burst the bubble and, but it took probably a couple of years for me to, you know, I kept pushing it away and he, you know, I said, that's not what I do. And he actually said to me, you know, kind of, come on, this is history, you know, who, how many people know the history of the small town mob? So, um, you know, he prompted me on this and, you know, history, when you do history, when you do uh, nonfiction memoir, when it's still in living memory, it has a funny way of coming back to you. I talked to him, I talked to Frank last night and he's talking about the book and all these things that, you know, he's seeing reviews and all that. And he said, I have to tell you that all the years I was in Las Vegas, I listened to Fresh Air all the time. And I turn on Fresh Air and there you are talking about the book and you said my name. <laughs> and it was such a nice way of the whole thing looping back around, you know, so um uh, there are downsides to to writing about living people, but there are upsides too. Wow, he must have felt pretty triumphant. He really, he kind of made it happen. <laughs> he did make it happen, yeah. Um, but but I, it, just to piggyback onto that for one second, um, the thing that that is so thrilling about this, I think there's a kind of um, a, a perfect storm of skills that you bring to it and, and an ability to sift through a lot of facts, a lot of very elderly gentlemen in and out of you know hospital and nursing home beds whom you were interviewing. Um, but there's also the story of your father and your relationship to him, which is sort of central right from the beginning. And can you just talk a little bit about how that, um, sort of how you ended up partnering with him to work on this project? Yeah, it, it, I came at this as history because that's what I do. And that's what I, that was my, most comfortable way in. I kind of convinced myself that I was writing history, which was like the other books I've done, um, which is ridiculous on, on, uh, in retrospect, because of course it's, I, my, my, I was named after my grandfather. I was searching for someone with my name. Um, and uh, one of the things I kind of tried doing ridiculously early on was not really involving my father, um, it, who was my grandfather's eldest son, and I knew perfectly well that their relationship was this very fraught uh, relationship, and I knew that it had to do with, with the mob, with that business. Um, so it was actually, you know, some time before I got around to the point where I said, I can't, I was kind of like, you know, you're, you're trying to avoid this thing that's right in front of you, and finally I had to say, Dad, will you work on this with me? And uh, and he, you know, my father, he died uh, unfortunately uh, near the end of our work on it. But um, he uh, his he was always a very open person, and so I kind of took my cues from him in this. And he liked to say, I think it was an AA thing. He would say, "You're only as sick as your secrets." So you know, he we went. It became this father son thing where we would go, and he'd call up some old guy, and he'd say, "What are you doing? We're coming over." And and we'd sit down for an hour or two and I'd get this whole other little window onto, you know, back in the day and what it was like. And, um, and you know, it's, 
so what I did was ultimately kind of a combination of history and memoir. Um, and that was important to me because I didn't want, I couldn't just rely on people reflecting 60 years ago and take that as, as gospel. Um, so I, my strategy was I did, I don't know, 250 hours worth of interviews with people, but I, um, I did the library work, I, the, the, the police archive and the county courthouse and FBI Freedom of Information Act requests and, and, and slowly you know, worked that kind of documentary layer that I could put up against the other. And what I hope that I uh, was doing in the writing was kind of signaling to the reader when we're in history mode and when we're more in memory and memoir mode. So that, you know, if I'm talking about the Italian Risorgimento in the 19th century, this is history. Uh, but if I'm, you know, what I would do is have a scene where I'm sitting with my dad and his buddy Bob Meager, and they're both like 80 years old, and we're in Bob's backyard, and and they're telling stories about the early and mid 50s and how their their lives kind of skirted this mob outfit in the pool hall and all that. Clearly, we're in a different zone there. And I'm hoping then that the reader can can kind of assess, work that out and say, okay, we're in kind of a different mode here in terms of, uh, of how grounded things are, if you know what I mean. But you know, the whole time I'm doing this, I'm thinking about that line, fiction, nonfiction. And it, I mean, it's, I think nonfiction writers are um, fooling themselves if they think everything they're doing is straight up factual. You know, so much of it is interpretation. And um, one thing I was struck by, I'm gonna elegantly switch now and ask you a question, um, was in, in Manhattan Beach is um, you've created this very lush real world with these these, these, um, I don't know, there's this, this current of sadness through it to me. Um, and it is so anchored in its time and place in New York in the, I mean, to me, it's basically, for, I'm sure everyone who's tuning in uh, has read it. But um, to me, it's a father daughter story set in and around World War Two, uh, in New York. And um, uh, I, gu I guess my question is, did you have one colonel and was that a hit was your colonel a a character that just popped into your mind that you started with or was it from the beginning something a historical anecdote about new york in that period that that got you started you know it's so funny that you talk about it as a father-daughter story it clearly is um although that did i didn't really realize that for quite a while um the Colonel, I think, really was 9-11 and just seeing New York become a war zone instantaneously, which led me to wonder a few things, um, what it was like here during World War II, uh, what it felt like when America's uh, status as a superpower was first um, was first coming into place, as opposed to, you know, it feels more and more now kind of waning. Um, and just sort of what that moment felt like. So it was really very vague. And, you know, I, and I, I, there was certainly a, one of the big surprises when I started working was that I, I got interested in the Brooklyn Navy Yard early and I was fascinated by the women who worked there and I thought I might want to write about a woman who works there, but I tend to write very blind in my first drafts. And I was very surprised to find that I was writing about a father and a daughter. And it's, I think one thing that was so moving to me in reading about your book, which is explicitly and, and literally about you and your dad solving this mystery is that I came to sort of feel that in a way, a lot of sort of not mystery, but, but old sadness, sort of sadness from other generations in my own family really kind of came up through this book. And it's so funny that you, that you mentioned that. And Specifically, you know, my, I didn't really know my own father that well. He was, he died, at, he was killed in an accident when he had just turned 60. Um, and he and my mother were divorced when I was really little. I actually have no memory of them together. And he ended up remarrying and he had three kids from his second marriage and I grew up in another city. So I just never really knew him that well. 
but his he was very clannishly his family was very irish american my grandfather was a cop actually ultimately a police commander and there's a lot of law enforcement on that side of the family but there was an old tragedy when my father was a uh, about 20 um his his beloved brother who was just two years younger than he was went on a quick motorcycle ride um, during a family barbecue just to spin around the block with a friend and they were hit and my my uncle um, whose name was Eddie was killed on the spot and it was just an absolute catastrophe that had so many implications for that family um, they dealt with it in a very kind of typically old school Irish American way which meant wake funeral not mentioned again <laughs> You can imagine how well that worked for my poor grandmother. Um, and, and both my father and my uncle, the third brother, both struggled with alcohol very seriously. Um, my father ultimately got sober. And I think his, a lot of the pain that I felt in my father arose from that event. And so I, I guess in some way in this book, it felt like my chance to reckon with that Irish American world that had made him. Um, and, but I didn't really know that until I got in pretty deep and I, I'm glad I didn't because I might've just walked away. You know, it was a little like you thinking I'm going to not involve my father yeah. in the story about his father. I mean, how was that going to happen? Right. And yet when you, um, give that backstory, I mean, that, that kind of generational sadness seemed to transfer. I mean, that's what, however, I don't know how consciously uh you were working that in um and when you what do you mean when you say you were you wrote it blind well i just when i write first drafts i don't know what's going to happen i i try to write in a very um kind of spontaneous you know uh automatic state and then only when i have a first draft do i type it up and read it and kind of decide what the book will be so i thought that eddie the father whom i named after this departed long departed uncle of mine um, I thought he was going to have a very small part in the book. And it was really a surprise to me when he kind of insisted upon becoming a very major character. Um, but by then there wasn't, wasn't too much I could do about it. But I think another reason I, I related so much to your story is that the, your, your grandfather, Russell Shorto, um, was a man of, you know, a tremendous, I guess what we would say now, clearly a very, um, a troubled individual. Very, huge, very serious drinking problem, lots of womanizing that I think we would almost call pathological if we were looking at it through our contemporary lens. Um, so much pain and kind of flailing in that life, which then caused ripples through, of course, the rest of your family, including, you know, his two illegitimate sons. And I mean, it, it made me think about this intergenerational pain and sort of where you know, you struggled with with a difficulty of getting to really know your grandfather. And I love the way you, you dealt with that in a very straightforward way. You said, you know, I'm finding all this great stuff, but like, where is he? Where is Russ? And then that's a moment where you take us back to his own origins back in Sicily, which was a fascinating part of the book. Um, but I wonder if you could comment on to the ways in which that history impacted your grandfather and thereby everyone else. I think, you know, I have to um, thank Marsha again because uh, for having the insight to put us together because I think uh, their both books have this immigrant generational pain in them. Uh, and it is a, a you know, it was, um, once I kind of gave myself over to the idea that, okay, I, this is going to be, per that was the question, how personal does this have to be? Um, and once I allowed, started to allow myself to, to make it that, um, uh, then I, I began to realize you're, you know, I, mean, I write history. Well, when you do family history, your family is in history. And, you know, the, to see these generations come the generation that came from the old country. And in the case of Southern Italians, it was about 4 million of them that came in a pretty short period of time. And then uh, this squalor and this discrimination and, and um, 
And that's one era, that's one generation. And then the next generation, they're, they're very much colored by all of that, but they're Americans, you know, they're going to American school and they're taught to admire George Washington and Henry Ford and, 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 um, and yet not able to, um, to really partake of the system. You know, there was no way my grandfather and people of that generation were going to, uh, were going to uh, uh, be able to go to college and, and, you know, become a president of a factory or a, a bank or a, a supermarket chain or anything like that. And yet, and then here comes prohibition. So, and, and it's this, this opportunity to kind of follow the American dream, you know? Um, and, in the, and, and, and that story is mirrored all over the country. You know, people are doing that all at the same time as if on cue. And it's, you know, doing this kind of research now, it was so resonant because we are yet again, I mean, the 1920s were this era of, um, of you know, this huge backlash against immigrants. In that case, it was mostly Catholic immigrants. And here we are again uh, in an era of backlash against immigrants. And one of the things that that led to was the mafia, which was this became this disease that preyed on the, the body of the country, essentially. Um, and I wonder kind of, well, where are we now with that, you know? And to see that generation then move, you know, fall, flow into your parents' generation. And then, you know, you, 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 I guess the upside of doing this, it's very hard work and it's painful. And, and, and sometimes you're, you're uh, dealing with relatives, uh, you know, people, some people want to go there full steam and others don't want to go there at all. And, uh, and I guess that's a difference between us because if you're doing fiction, then you don't have to, I mean, it's somebody else. It's these people on the page. It's not your family, even though the way you, laid that out, it was, it felt to me like this is suddenly a, almost a family story of yours. Yeah, it did feel that way at a certain point. And I dedicated it to my uncle, the third, the only remaining brother um, from that family um, and my half siblings, my father's three children from his second marriage. And, you know, I feel that I kind of knew my father better when I finished this book than I did before. And that, and that was great, you know, because I can't wow. do that in person because he's not here. But, but I think there is a way, you know, when, when you said in frustration, you know, I can't get to Russ, where is he? He's this sort of, he's this kind of absent center. And yet going into the history helped to deliver him to us. And I guess in a way that's exactly how it was with my father, going into the history, understanding better the sort of some of the pathologies um, in Irish American culture, which which began in Ireland um, while being oppressed by the English and were, were you know brought here as coping strategies where the Irish too suffered from a lot of discrimination. Um, you know, and I and 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 then this kind of really bad way of dealing with trauma, which was to not to tell lots of great stories, but not about that, not about the thing that really mattered. And then of course the drinking, which was a huge cultural element. So I felt like I, I understood better why he was the man he was and why, you know, why our relationship was the way it was. And it, it gave me a sense of peace. And, but I think because I had to do that without him there, I took a special joy and was kind of deeply moved to see you and your dad go from um, kind of a, a, a painful beginning where he was hurt, actually clearly hurt by your unwillingness to involve him to becoming your partner um, in, in, in doing this, which it sounds like brought you closer than you had ever been. That was, that was really the feeling that I had. Yeah, I think, and, and I think that's true. And at the same time, you know, it's funny, we were doing this, um, as I say, this father-son activity of looking for his father, for the, the man who was behind both of us, which is a very, it gets into all these things that you're talking about. And yet we, you know, we did it a little bit clinically, you know, it was, it was easier that way. We didn't, um, you know, we didn't fall over each other weeping or anything like that. You know, it was, um, 
but I think that was, and, and especially in his case, you know, because as I said, my father spent um, a large chunk of his life living in the same town with his father, but not speaking. And they circle, you know, they had similar circles and all that. Um, so I think he was doing this for his own, I mean, he was helping me, but he was doing this uh, as well uh, for his own purposes, but in his own way, to the extent that he could, you know, I mean, there are, you know, you, you ask people, I learned a lot about interviewing people about the past, and you ask people, you, you can try to just say, well, tell me about the bit, that big event, and you'll get something. But, you know, they, they have, over 50 years, they've built so many layers and defenses in there that uh, even if they want to just come right out with it, it's just not there. It's not available to them. So that's a, uh, 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 you know, you work with what you can. You know, one thing, there, we have a question um, that's come in that I'm curious about too. So you're in the middle of, of delivering this book into the world and getting public reactions. You clearly have a big sprawling family. What kinds of reactions are you getting from them? Those you interviewed, those you may not have, it, it's gotta be complicated. Yeah, it's complicated. Um, I, obviously in the case of my father um, and others, I involved family members. Um, my my daughter and my stepson transcribed interviews. Um, both of my daughters did uh, some uh, archival work for me. And um, my one daughter is a real, um, she's a book doctor and she's great at, you know, looking at the whole thing and saying, I think it would be better if you move this all the way to the front. So in that sense, it was great to have uh, uh, them involved. Uh, and for the most part, uh, beyond that, I have a a big, you know, Italian American family that is pretty open. And for the most part, people, uh, and I think it helps that enough time had passed, you know, it wasn't right in front we, you know, this was the 40s and the 50s is the main period here we're talking about. Um, so for the most part, I think uh, uh, people wanted to go there. And, and, and we're curious, because, you know, as I said at the start, you know, people didn't really talk about this. So everybody had their little window onto it. So they were curious what it would look like when I tried to put all this together. Um, which is not to say that there aren't people who didn't want me to do it. And I know they're not happy about it. And um, I have talked with other writers who've written memoirs and they've had similar experiences. And Ultimately, you have to say, no, I understand where you're coming from, but I have a right to do this too. And that's what that's what my dad said too, because we talked about this as we went. Um, so it's not easy. So I've, I've become a big promoter of doing family history, but this is one of the things that you have to be aware of too. Can you talk a little bit, we have a question about, I described sort of writing in this blind way, which I, I'm quite sure is not the approach you used in, in writing nonfiction. Um, but can you talk a little bit about your process? And then I have a couple of specific craft questions about um, how you structured the book. But first, just kind of give us a sense of your writing methodology and how it interacts with research. All right, but first I'm gonna turn that around and ask you, um, you wrote blind a 430 page novel. You just sat down and did the whole thing and then said, okay, now what did I just do? Yeah, I did. And it was longer than that, let me tell you. Um, it was 20, something like 28 legal pads. Um, yeah, what I tend to so do- So you do it by hand, I mean, longhand. Yep, sitting right over there in that, uh, <laughs> in that desk. Um, you know, it's a, it's a ridiculous way to work. It could not be more inefficient. But the reason I do it is that it allows me to come up with material that I can't seem to think of consciously. It kind of seems to let me think of things that that aren't the obvious things or that aren't as obvious to me. So I'll write five to seven pages. I read it over the next day only enough to get back into the flow. And then I write five to seven more. And that went on for a year and a half. So that was a huge mess, which was so forbidding and so ill-researched at the beginning because how can I research when I don't know what my plot is? I mean, I had- Well, that was my- <laughs> That was my next question. You've, you, you know, and that gets into the whole history question. You've, this, you, you did this before really immersing yourself in the, in the research? I had done some research and actually one of the big things I had done was partnered with um, the Brooklyn Historical Society, which is what this institution um, was called before it recently merged with the Brooklyn Public Library. 
with the Brooklyn Historical Society and the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So the three of us had a partnership to work on an oral history project and try to interview everyone living who had worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And we luckily started this in around 2005 because those people were in their 80s then. And I, I believe that almost every single person I was involved with interviewing has passed away at this point. But we, we just did tons of interviews and I wasn't present for a lot of them. And I was present for others. So that hearing those stories was a great first step um, because it was both very specific and very general. It covered, we interviewed people of all ethnicities and you know walks of life and it just, got my mind working about a number of things, one of which, and then I wanna get back to my question, was the, um, the, the kind of pervasiveness of gangsterism. Again and again in these oral history interviews, people in various ways seem to know gangsters. It was, it was so strange. It's not what you would find today, I don't think. And what it made me realize is that during the war years, being a gangster was a quasi acceptable job description. And what it meant was, you know, former bootlegger now making up that income stream in some other way. And th there were there was a huge range in what those ways could have been. And you talk about some of them. Um, I mean, gambling was a huge one. Um, you know, the numbers, uh, pinball, I didn't know about that was fascinating. Um, but uh, but, you know, and, and nightlife, in, in, at least in New York, especially lots of nightclubs that had been former speakeasies. So that's really where I started to get the idea that you know, that there would be like a, you know, a strong sort of underworld figure in this book. What's fascinating to me about the, the shame that your family felt later about this association of your grandfather with the mob is that at the time, it doesn't seem like there was shame at all. There was pride. You know, this was a this was a really, I don't know if respectable is the right word, but this was an impressive amount of power to amass, and and he cut quite a figure in town. Yeah, that's a, a good point, and when you put it that way, I hadn't really thought it, uh, thought about that before. That um, in his heyday, he was, uh, he, you know, everybody over a certain age in town who I interviewed. They knew everything, as you say. They everybody knew a gangster. They knew they knew that City Cigar, which was a, a cigar shop in front and a pool hall behind it, and it was two doors from City Hall. They knew that that was the center of their operation, and that they had their offices upstairs. And they knew the GI Bank was this numbers game that everybody in town played. And um, they knew, you know, everybody knew this. They didn't have to be in that business to know it, but they partook of it because it was part of. It was a, a, an entertainment service that that um, that they were providing, and it was, and he was respected. Um, but over, you know, that's the '40s and the '50s. The '50s is really the heyday of it, I think. Um, and then it starts to change, I guess, and it starts to change when the government is cracked down, uh, starts cracking down on it. And uh, it really becomes identified, you know, uh, organized crime as this kind of, uh, I was also fascinated to in reading histories of organized crime that the very term came into being as a way to stigmatize ethnic organized crime, as opposed to sort of standard American capitalism, which functioned very similarly. Um, so I think in that period, once you get into the 60s and beyond, then it started to become something that was maybe shameful. So now back to the writing process, and that will also kind of answer a number of questions that we have about just the relationship between history and memoir, and, and if you can get a little more into the, the challenges of trying to do both. Yeah, and I don't know, you know, I, I feel like, um, Every book of mine is kind of an experiment, and this one was an experiment that I was carrying out while I was writing it. And that was the the question: Am I is this his, to what extent is it history, and to what extent is it memoir? And I wanted it to be both. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, when it was done, and I was talking with my editor, and we were talking about of all things an index because I write histories, and you always have an index, uh, an index, and. She said something about, well, we don't need an index. And I said, well, why not? And she said, 
Russell, this is a memoir. And I said, oh, okay. So, you know, I mean, it, it, that, that um, tension kind of carried through uh, throughout the whole process with me. Um, I decided to write this in such a way that I was trying to involve the reader in that question. And in the, you were with me as I'm, as Frank broaches this with me and, and as I'm saying, well, all right, I'm gonna write, you know, okay, I'm, I'm gonna write history. And then, as you said, whenever I reach this point where I just can't get this figure of my grandfather, even though people are telling me all these stories about him, I can't get close to him. And that was because he was this incredibly quiet person. The first thing everybody said to me about him, oh, Russ, he was very quiet. That doesn't help a great deal if you're trying to unearth the person. And then I said to myself, all right, I'm going to put on the other hat and I'm just going to go straight history. Let's go to Italy. Let's go to Sicily. Let's go to the village his parents were born in. Let's see that the, the house his father grew up in. Um, and, uh, and then that helped, you know, so the two things, that process going back and forth um, helped me to, to kind of stitch this thing together and gave me the sense that while the center of the book is uh, recollections. Um, it's I'm 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 undergirding it as best I can, and and I'm trying to signal to the reader, here's where we're in history, and here's where you know this is, you know I'm putting these in quotes, and these old guys are telling me this story. So you, if you choose to take that with a grain of salt, then then feel free. Um, all right, now look, can I can I switch in? And I, I don't know. You're getting questions. I'm not seeing them, but. Um, but I have a question that I really would like to ask. Um, you, um, you, you have an acknowledgement section at the back of the book where you go on for quite uh, uh, some time on different sources, on, on the Brooklyn Navy Yard, on uh, these oral history sources and, and, and diving. And, and uh, um, I would kind of think that there would be the desire to you know, you're creating a work of fiction and it is this confection that you want to, you want people to feel that it just came out of nowhere, out of your, you know, in your blind. Uh, um, and so that, and, and by doing that though, you're giving people a little bit of a map of, you know, like a, uh, how, how you put this thing together almost. Is that, did, was that a, ever a question you always wanted to do it that way? I felt I really had to because people helped me so much. Certain individuals and texts, they absolutely had to be acknowledged. Um, and there were just, and, and actually, I, I, in a way, those, those acknowledgments have led to even other interesting things. Like I, a whole part of my book takes place in, um, in the world of merchant sailing. And right. there's a ship that's torpedoed and some really terrible things happen to a, a small group of survivors. And that some of those details are taken directly from a memoir that was written by a guy who was a, a merchant seaman cadet from the Merchant Marine Academy right here in New York, um, who had the, these harrowing things happen to him when he went at sea to sea for his sea project. And you know, it would be I, there, it would be ap reprehensible of me to use details like that and not acknowledge where I got them. But then the thing that's so interesting is that in a way a book is still alive and I think you're gonna find this too, I'm sure. I ended up hearing from the great niece of the man who wrote that memoir, who's now passed away, a guy named um, Herman Rosen. And she said that he, he and his, a very few people from this life raft survived. I think only five out of like 20 something, terrible proportion um, of survivors um, after a month at sea. And he, it was what had, they had undergone was so grisly that he and the others made a pact that they would never acknowledge each other again and that no one would tell the story of what had happened until wow. everyone else had died and they were the only ones left. And this woman who emailed me was with her great uncle at Union Station in Washington and they walked by one of the other survivors and the, they didn't acknowledge each other, but after they had passed him, her uncle told her that he had, he had just passed someone that he had been through all of this with. I mean, it was such a it was so fascinating to hear that story. 
it, it's it's so worth acknowledging everything so that the conversation can keep sure. it going, you know. And that is different from say a visit from the Goon Squad. You don't oh, you don't yeah. get those kinds of uh I mean, so that's a for you a real departure I'm I'm imagining in in writing historical fiction in which you are saying here here are sources on on, on which some of this is based. Absolutely. And and while I take my liberties for sure, um I felt that in order to know where I could take liberties, I had to know exactly what the facts were because it's very difficult. I mean, in especially writing about a World War II period, there are a lot of people who know very, very well what went on. It, it, let's say, well, any kind of military history, of course, but in general, it's a very studied and cataloged period of American life. So, you know, if I get it wrong, and I actually did make a lot of factual errors, not in my areas of real, where I required a lot of expertise because I had had people vet those, but in other areas, like for example, Catholicism, I made several mistakes there. So they all had to be fixed. And, and people jumped on those. They did. <laughs> um, my status as a lapsed Catholic was revealed. <laughs> um, but it was very important for me to know where there was, uh, where there was enough ambiguity that I could I could make things happen that weren't out of the question. That is something I, I wanted to ask you um, that um, I think um, I, somewhere I read uh, an interview with uh, Edward Jones, the, the author of um, The Known World, the great uh, Civil War novel. Um, and I, I believe if I, you know if I'm remembering this right, he said he doesn't mind completely making up history if it suits his purposes. And I guess he's trusting in his, you know, power as a storyteller to pull you through and say, you know, so that you feel this is the way it happened. You didn't uh, operate that way, it seems. No, I, I didn't. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, there's, with fiction, you can approach it any, any possible way. Um, it, I think that that maybe he was creating a world that was sort of one step removed from reality, but my world was very, had, you know, very deeply engaged with reality. And that was part of, I mean, the physical world of New York City at that time, um, you know, I wanted as much real fact in there as I could get, because the real stuff is so fun anyway like why you attempted to just we attempted to just run away with it with the with you know research and just uh um i mean i think there are those who would say that i did <laughs> um <laughs> that there was a, a layer of detail that could have been removed possibly um i found and i wonder if you felt this i was so enamored of my research i i lost track of the fact that to the average person you know, uh, the Merchant Marine Handbook for, uh, you know, officers, a, a multi-hundred page volume from 19, you know, 43 would not be a fascinating document to read on the elliptical machine. But to me, it was. Right. So there was that problem of not, uh, of having to, and I learned this from my reader, from various readers that I showed the book to, that, you know, there, these details are not inherently interesting. They were in, interesting to me because I was so deep in it. And that's kind of how it works sometimes when you start getting deeper and deeper into a subject. Yeah, I have had that experience often in doing uh, uh, long magazine pieces where you have to get so immersed in it. Like I did a, a long piece about a uh, 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 um, uh, fine arts dealer who discovers a Rembrandt painting. And you're so immersed in this world. And then at a certain point, you have to, in order to write this, you have to say, wait, I'm not writing for the person I am at this moment who's steeped in this. I have to remember who I was three months ago when I started this. That's the person I'm writing for. Exactly. We have a question here that I think is, is it, it certainly was fascinating to me reading the book, and I'd love it if you could touch on it. If you could talk a little more about the ethnic implications of looking at Italian Americans as criminals in this mob world versus the quote unquote respectable, you know, robber barons, essentially. The, the ethnic part of this is really, um, it's fascinating. It's fascinating history. Um, I'd love it if you talk a little more about it. It's, that. you know, to me, it's, this is a little bit uh, what we talked about before, um, American immigration. America says, come, we want you to do this work that we don't wanna do. 
and millions of people come and then American discrimination kicks in and says, no, we don't, we, you know, we don't, we don't like you and we don't want you, we, we want you to live over there. And, uh, and then this is uh, one of the outcomes, these different ethnic um, gangs, different um, forms of ethnic crime, which to, at, up to some level, and I think this is a difference between small towns and big cities, um, there wasn't nearly the level of violence in small towns because they couldn't sustain it. You know, everything was out in the open. And if you started gunning people down, I mean, that then you would bring down too much heat in the town, then you would be shut down. Um, so that, so this is a form of uh, business enterprise that is happening that, that is providing a service that people want. Um, and uh, they are relegated to that because they're excluded from others. And it's not just Italians, it's Irish and there were Jewish gangs. And, um, and uh, so that was, I think, you know, one reason I didn't wanna go there with this story for the longest time, to the extent that I never even saw like a Godfather movie. You know, I never wanted, because it just felt like, oh, I am a stereotype. My life is this, you know, um, so then I, I thought, all right, if, you know, as I got immersed in it, I said, all right, I think I can do this in such a way that it is so ordinary small town American life. It's so woven into that, that it may be a little bit, I'm, I'm showing that trope, this, you know, Italian mafia thing, but I'm also showing it as just part of life. And these people have a family on a middle uh, in a house on a middle class street and you know the the packard out front and just all that kind of stuff um so that it's uh, it's kind of exploding the myth a little bit one thing johnstown comes through so strongly in it's in its small american city you know thriving in the in the industry post war um a wartime and post war industry and it reminded me a lot of a city I know well, which is Rockford, Illinois, um, which sounds in some ways similar um, in terms of when it kind of reached its zenith. And it sounds like you're, you still have a lot of family in Johnstown. What is it like now? Uh, the town is, you know, in its heyday, it was close to 70,000 people and the, the steel mills, that was the main industry and they were booming. And it's a classic Rust Belt town is now, I think 19,000 people. Um, I believe a few years ago, it was ranked the poorest city in Pennsylvania. Um, but, you know, a great place to be from, wonderful people. And I can't believe, the book has been out for a month, and I can't believe how much the town, <clears throat> the town has embraced this book. And, um, and I think partly it's that, see, because it's really, in a, in a way, a, a portrait of the town in its heyday. And um, I think a lot of people are saying, yeah, look, look, you know, look at what we were, look at what we had. And, and I've gotten a lot of emails from people from other towns like Rockford or like Utica or Fresno or something um, where they had similar kind of gritty past. Uh, it was a real blue collar town and it was a place where you could be a mill worker or something and have a wife and have a family and own your own home and own a car and buy these new appliances that were coming. And it's like, where is that America? You know, what happened to that America? And so I, it's, it's an interesting thing as a writer to do something that, that touches people there, you know, because if I write a book about uh, the, the Dutch founding of New York, certain kinds of people are interested in that, but it's not mostly people with a blue collar background from a small town in Illinois or wherever. Is there a bookstore? There are two bookstores and I, um, they keep wanting me to come back and sign more books and that's wonderful. And uh, they wanna have events, but, and Frank last night said to me, he's now, he plays a, Frank, my mother's cousin who got me into this, who's a musician, he plays stand up bass and he sings, you know, Fly Me to the Moon and My Funny Valentine and all that. And uh, he plays a regular lunchtime set at the Holiday Inn when there's not a pandemic. And so he was calling me to tell me that, uh, you know, when they open up again, he's got a great idea. He'll play and in between sets, I'll sign books. And I said, of course I'll do that, that's fine. Oh my again, God. it all loops really... back when you do nonfiction set. You know, it's, it's also really fun, I've learned, to write something that is set in, in within living memory because you're still interacting and people are still 
it's resonating off of people right now, which is fun. I love the thought that you'll do, uh, you'll actually combine with Frank and do a joint event because- We'll do a gig, yeah. It's just so great. Yeah. Um, so a couple more questions. We have a few people asking about how you interview people. And you alluded earlier to the fact that you can't just come in, you know, like boom, give me the give me the the bottom line. And I I learned this too as a um, as an oral history interviewer, and I I really struggled with it because I I come from more of a journalistic background where you're really just trying to get to it. And I found that not only did I have less of a chance of getting to it by doing that, but it actually kind of it, it almost. It, 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 it resulted in less information than I would have gotten otherwise. So do you come in with a list of questions and kind of sidle your way toward what you're trying to get or what, what sort of methodology of interviewing did you? Um, yeah, assuming that the person wants to, you know, <laughs> wants to work with you. And, you know, the, the, the problem is that the, the mind isn't a computer and you can't just, you know, press this button and it takes you back to this day in 1962 or something. Um, so I, uh, I had all kinds of mundane questions that I ask people uh, to try to get them back in that period, you know? And I mean, like I will, I, one thing I, I found effective was to, if, if it's their childhood that I'm talking about, ask them to take me through their house. We're at the front door, open the door, what's, you know, what, what room are we in first? What's on the walls? And then they'll, and you know, they'll be like, so then, you know, because they know all that, but they haven't thought about that in X number of years. So when you are, take them into, it's kind of like the memory palace notion. And when you are in, you know, their brother's bedroom or whatever, and you see that thing that's on the wall and that reminds them of some sport or whatever thing they did that weekend. And, you know, the, the idea is to open up those those pathways that are still there to those memories at that time. And once we're doing that, you know, I loved it when people would say, oh, I haven't thought about this in 70 years, you know. Um, so once you're doing that, then you can start to get to some of these things. And sometimes it just happens because you've, you've you know, loosened things up enough that you get to this stuff that's, you know, and, and a lot of it, too when you're writing a book is just the little details, the kind of cars people drove and how they dressed and the hats they wore and you know all that stuff. Wow, I love that because I love that it's so, that you locate them in place and that that is what actually helps to open up the memory. That's so fascinating. Um, you structure the book around a murder. And I wonder if you could talk about how that decision came about? Was that, did you know that from the beginning? Was that, did that happen through trial and error? What, what was behind that choice? When I was first sitting down with people, almost everybody I would talk with uh, would say, you know, we're talking about the, 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 the boys, the outfit back in the day. And they would say, well, do you know about Pippi? This Pippi DeFalco, this guy who was murdered, Bookie was murdered. Um, and so it became a regular thing and they'd tell me their version or who they think did it because it was never solved. Uh, and at first I thought, okay, well, this is convenient. I'm writing a book about the mob and here's a murder and you know, I'll weave that in somehow. Uh, but over time, I started to realize that this is, this is about my grandfather and his world and his, aid, his heyday and then his, the collapse and, and, and the aftermath. And it, as I gathered more and more evidence, I realized this murder, because what I was talking about before, um, in small towns, there weren't so much, uh, this kind of thing, this kind of thing didn't happen. Um, this was the beginning of the end for them. This is the thing that, it, because it happened in 1960, Kennedy was coming in, uh, Bobby Kennedy, his brother uh, becomes uh, attorney general with this mandate to crack down on the mob. So suddenly Bobby Kennedy in Washington is, is communicating with the mayor of this little town in Pennsylvania saying, hey, and sending FBI guys there. Uh, so that uh, connects these events to the larger story of the mob and it's the beginning of the end. Um, and it in my town and specifically for my grandfather, it was the beginning of the end. So it actually became quite central, even though I wasn't, um, wasn't thinking of it that way. Okay, can I ask you a question? Yep. Um, uh, how you 
move from uh, your main character is a woman named Anna, and she has a sister named Lydia, who has, I don't know if you name what her affliction is, but she has this terrible uh, wasting affliction and that needs 24 hour care from Anna and her mother. You are creating a, a, a historic, this is a, a story taking place in this historic set, historical setting. And the, that's, you know, I'm picking one example to ask this broader question of how you move back and forth. So did, did you, in, in your blind uh, writing, did, you, did she just appear? And then you say, well, now that she appeared, I have to then go back and figure out what were the methods for taking care of a person like this at that time? I mean, what's the interplay between your storytelling and inspiration and, and, the, and your historical work? I think it started as with the sense that um, sort of mob activity would be central. It began with the oral histories, um, both uh, those that I was involved with and then a, a huge um, additional number that I read, where again and again, it, the refrain would come up of someone who couldn't leave home. And therefore another person who would often be the designated person who would have to care for the person who couldn't leave home. And I think all of that led me to consider what it would be like to live in Row House, New York, which is a world of stairs, um, usually only five stories, but sometimes six because they would trickily call the first floor, the, the ground floor zero, so they could add an extra floor. What on earth it would have been like to try to live in that kind of New York with a serious physical problem. And so I think that's kind of where it started. Then, then Lydia appeared in, in this blind way. And I was concerned about, about writing about someone like that because I thought, you know, there's a potential lack of drama around a person who doesn't have a lot of agency. Um, but she felt inextricable. And I did some more research, not really all that much um, compared to other areas. Um, but it was, you know, again, that sense of, a refrain from the past that led me to reflect on the present and that the gap between those two, and this is going to lead me to, I think my final question for you, because we're almost out of time, unbelievably, I feel like we could go on so much longer, but another area where I thought as I was working on Manhattan beach, that there was this enormous gap between that time and now was in sort of women in the workplace and the specific uh, thing that I'm thinking of is that for a couple of years at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, women were not allowed on ships. They were working at a Navy Yard. They were plumbers, riveters, welders, electricians. They couldn't go on the ships. And the reason was there was a fear that the men in these close quarters would not be able to control themselves. Now, as I, as I read this and learned of it, and of course the women were furious. They were, they were doing all this work on things for ships. Ultimately, they did get on the ships and they were physically much better equipped to move around in these in these tight quarters sometimes than the men. Um, but I found myself thinking, you know, boy, we've really come a long way. I mean, imagine the thought that men would not be able to control themselves in the workplace. I mean, come on. <laughs> and the month that the book came out was October 2017, which is when Me Too erupted. And I thought, wait a minute, maybe I was drawn to this, not because of the gap between then and now, but because of the connection between that then and now. Mm -hmm. All of which leads me to ask you, picking up from a question on here, to just maybe give us a final reflection on just your thoughts about America and where we are now. You've talked about the, the resonance of the, the fear of immigrants, the desire to repress immigration, where, where does the research you've done for small time leave you in terms of thinking about America today and where where we stand and where we're going? This is, you know, people are, Americans are proud of that this is a, a nation of immigrants. And at the same time, you know, the <clears throat> abuse of immigrants. I mean, as I said before, let's let them in and now let's, let's uh, you know, restrict them, abuse them. Um, try to stop them from coming. Uh, that is a pattern that plays out all through, I mean, from the very beginning, all through the 19th century, and then you, you within uh, our lifetime in the, in the 20th century, and, uh, and is going on right now. So these, I mean, so many of the, uh, my previous book, 
uh, was a revolution song was about the American Revolution. And, you know, so many of these themes, themes that are kind of the, the, the thing that we're proud of right next to this thing that this, this, this shameful trait that we can't seem to get rid of. Um, those things are coupled right, right the way through. And we're still, I don't know that we're any closer to, to solving that. Well, it's a little bit of a frustrating place to land, but I don't know how we could really land elsewhere on the topic of immigration. Um, but I will, I will close there by thanking you so much, Russell. I feel like we just need to now meet at the coffee shop and talk for another two hours because there's so much to discuss. And thank you all of you for these great questions. I apologize to the people whose questions I didn't get to, but I tried to monitor um, the ones that were coming in. And thank you so much to the Brooklyn Public Library and the Center for Brooklyn History for giving us a chance to explore these incredibly rich topics. One thing that's uh, unfortunate about, uh, many things unfortunate about a virtual event is that we can't like after this, okay, let's go have a drink and- I know, I know. Uh, we can't yeah. chat with our audience and like right, have this, this right. lingering conversations. On the other hand, I bet we have people from a much wider sure. uh, realm than we would otherwise. So I guess so, it's a give and take. Thank you very much, Jenny. It was very gracious of you to do this. Uh, and I'm very appreciative. And Marcia, wherever you are, thank you very much as well. Thank you all. Have a great night. Stay healthy and uh, next time in person. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>